Hi everyone. Today we're starting on a new module called the Cosmic Engine. Uh, we're starting uh, with some of our views of the universe. Uh, and so in models of the universe, we'll be looking at some of the older models of the universe and how those progressed into our current understanding of the universe. We'll be looking especially at some of the differences between them and the evolution, if you like, of the different ideas through time. So we're going to be starting with geocentric models of the universe. Uh, geocentric models, as we can see here, have Earth right in the middle and everything else sort of spinning around it. So, let's start right at the beginning. Many ancient civilizations uh, from all different continents of the world have studied the motion of the heavenly bodies. The reason for this was because they thought that the motion of the stars and planets affected earthly affairs. And so they were very interested, of course, in knowing what the stars said were going, was going to happen or what the planets were lining up or things like that. Uh, and so some examples of uh, cultures who used this sort of thing for their astrology were the Chinese astrology, Hindu astrology, Islamic astrology, and of course Western astrology. So uh, we have some observations of the sky, but we don't really have a sort of ordered system of uh, arranging where everything sort of lies in the universe. And so we go to Greece. The ancient Greeks were among the first people to use logic and observation to describe the universe. So there were plenty of uh, philosophers and scientists around Greece at this time. And they, of course, wanted to create models for everything to sort of describe how it worked. And so in the 4th century BC, uh, Aristotle, who we can see over here, uh, developed a detailed model of the universe. Uh, this model was ac able to accurately describe the motions of the planets across the sky, as well as uh, the way that the stars didn't move. It wasn't in fact all that accurate, but uh, for a first try it was pretty good. So Aristotle's model was geocentric. Geocentric means Earth-centered, and so it placed Earth at the center of the universe. We can see that in this picture over here. Uh, Aristotle supposed that Earth was surrounded by a series of trans transparent crystalline spheres uh, and within each sphere was embedded a planet and on the outermost sphere there were the stars and so this model dominated science for almost 2,000 years. So each sphere around the earth uh, rotated at a different rate. So there was a sphere for the moon, there was a sphere for Mercury, there was a sphere for Venus, then beyond Venus we had a sphere for the Sun, uh, after that a sphere for Mars, a sphere for Jupiter, and a sphere for Saturn. At this point, uh, neither Uranus nor Neptune had been discovered. They were too far away and too faint to be seen with the naked eye. And so, beyond all the spheres of the planets, we had a sphere for the stars. And the stars were all embedded in this single sphere, which remained all the way at the outer edge. So, two centuries after Aristotle, in around 100 BC, a pair of Greek philosophers improved the existing model. They found some flaws with it, and they found ways to improve it. So Hippoarchus, which, uh, who we can see over here, showed that the model works better if the Earth was put just slightly off-center. So the Earth was sort of spinning around a little empty point in space. Uh, Apollonius discovered a way to better describe the motion of the planets using epicycles. He noticed that the uh, paths that the planets were following were not completely circular, but they seemed to vary back and forth sometimes. In real life, of course, this is because of the Earth's movement around the Sun, but back then they thought the Earth, of course, was stationary. So an epicycle is something like a circle within a circle. We can see a diagram of an epicycle over here. Apollonius suggested that the planets moved in small epicycles as they went around the bigger circle, the deferent circle. So we can see here as this little planet goes around its little epicycle, as it goes around the deferent circle, it sort of uh, moves back and forth. Uh, in real life, we know that this doesn't happen, and the apparent motion of the epicycles is simply because the Earth is moving around the Sun. So this model produced better predictions uh, than Aristotle's original model, uh, original model, and so of course it was adopted over the original model. Now in AD 140, Ptolemy took all the ideas of the universe, the slightly off-center Earth, the epicycles, and Aristotle's original idea, 
and describes a very mathematical model of the universe. And we can see a diagram of it over here. It's, uh, you can see, if you look carefully, the little epicircles that the various different uh, celestial bodies are making as they go around the Earth. Uh, it summarized the view of the universe proposed by all the earlier astronomers. Now, the use of epicycles made the model complex, as is fairly obvious to see here, I hope, but it made very accurate predictions, especially compared to Aristotle's original model. Uh, and for this reason, it remained dominant for uh, over, two th uh, over a thousand years. So the model uh, had some downfalls, some limitations. It couldn't explain why or how the planets moved. Suppose that perhaps there was uh, some sort of god sort of moving all the celestial bodies in circles or epicircles. And it couldn't really explain why the moon didn't get larger or smaller as it moved back and forth uh, during its epicycles. Uh, and so, of course, th these are fairly obvious limitations. And uh, Ptolemy would have been well aware of the limitations of his model. However, it could still make good predictions, and so it was still put to good use. Now, in the late 1500s, the Danish nobleman Tycho Brahe, seen here, built a series of observatories. Back in those days, they didn't have telescopes, so they just had to sort of sit back in the observatory and look up at the sky through a special window and sort of study exactly the locations of the stars very, very carefully. Uh, they took more measurements of celestial bodies than any other astronomer before him. And so um, in the late 1500s, in the early 17th century, Tycho Brahe had the largest database in the world of astronomical data. Um, they were also of a greater accuracy than any other astronomer before him. So this guy had a wealth of information uh, all he needed to do was analyze it in order to come up with a good model and come up with a model he did. So Brahe put forward a unique geoheliocentric model of the universe, which we can see in this uh, sketch over here. And so he proposed that all of the planets except the Earth go around the Sun because the careful observations that he made of the planets seemed to indicate that they were going around the Sun, but he couldn't sort of... Uh, throw away the idea that the Earth was stationary and that it was uh, still and didn't move. So the Sun and the Moon orbited the Earth, which was consistent with his data, uh, and the Earth was stationary in this model of his. Now although the Tychonian system, or the Tychonic system, was closer to the truth because it had bodies orbiting the Sun, it still placed Earth at the center of the universe, which we now know is wrong. So Brahe's huge collection of observations still has an important part to play. We'll learn a little bit more about it later, but for now, I'll just say that upon Brahe's death in 1601, he entrusted the tables uh, with all his ast astronomical data to Johannes Kepler. And as I said, we'll learn a little more about him later on. So the geocentric models are based on empirical data. And so they're based on uh, observations in the sky and not predictions, not mathematical models. Uh, this means that it's called something, uh, it's, it's called an empirical model. An empirical model is based on data and not based on models. And so empirical uh, models are usually very useful for predicting how a system will behave, uh, even if you don't understand the mechanics behind it. So empirical models are used even today in science to make predictions uh, when the underlying principles of something are not well understood. It's like noticing something happened 50 times and saying there must be a rule that that happens, but not knowing why. So this is the end of the theory. Uh, let's go on to some questions to test your knowledge about the geocentric model of the universe. Which observation of our current universe uh, is not a feature of Aristotle's model of the universe. Hmm, let's go through the options. A, the moon is a body orbiting the Earth. Well, even today, we believe that uh, the moon is uh, a body orbiting the Earth. And in Aristotle's model, all celestial bodies orbit the Earth. So this is um, something that's predicted by both our current model and Aristotle's model. All right? How about C, the planets move at different speeds? Well, we know from our talk in Aristotle's model 
uh, that the different speeds of the planets could be attributed to the different speeds of these celestial spheres that he believed surrounded the Earth. And so in both uh, our model and Aristotle's model, uh, the planets move at different speeds through the cosmos. Uh, is it D? The Earth is roughly spherical. Aristotle believed that the uh, Earth and the planets were perfect spheres, uh, and he also believed that the sort of celestial bodies orbiting the Earth uh, were perfect and completely spherical. We now know that this is not the case, but we still think that the Earth is, if not exactly, roughly spherical. So this is an observation that's maintained by both. Um, so our final option then is B, all stars are at different distances from the Earth. Now Aristotle believed that all the stars were on a single sphere that was sort of the edge of the universe, sort of right at the edge of the geocentric model. And today we know that this is not the case. So B is the correct answer. Today we know that all the stars are different distances from Earth, and in fact our Sun uh, is a star that's simply very close to Earth, which is what makes it different from all the others. Let's go on to the next question. Question two, what is an epicycle? Well, we have a few options here, don't we? Is it D, a pattern of stars in the sky? Well, that's not right, that's a constellation. I'm sure you know plenty of constellations, you know, Scorpio, Leo, Gemini. All right, uh, let's look at our op other options then. Uh, C, the length of time it takes for a planet to complete its orbit. Well, this is, of course, the orbit's period, uh, which is somewhat related to the period of things moving in circular motion. And so this is not an epicycle either. Is it a crystal sphere in which a planet is embedded? Uh, Aristotle called these celestial spheres, or something similar to it in Greek. Um, and so these are not epicycles. Epicycles are actually a modification to Aristotle's model that was made uh, several years later, or a century later or so. And so we find that an epicycle is, in fact, a circular variation of a planet's orbit. So I'll just highlight the next option. So epicycles were required to explain the motion of the planets as not being perfectly spherical. Today we know that's because the Earth has to move around the Sun as well. And so this means that when we observe other planets, they don't seem to be moving in complete circles around us. They seem to do these little sort of epicycle things. So we see that A is the correct answer. Question three. How did Tycho Brahe's uh, model differ from Ptolemy's model? Remember, Ptolemy was the uh, ancient Greek philosopher who compiled the ideas of Aristotle and the other astronomers into a single geocentric model. And Tycho Brahe's model had all the planets orbiting the Sun except for the Earth, which the Sun was orbiting around. So in Ptolemy's model, every celestial body orbited the Earth. It required epicycles to explain the planetary motions. In the Tychonian system, on the other hand, the planets orbited the Sun, and the Sun and the Moon orbited the Earth. And this meant that you didn't have to worry about uh, the little sort of variations that epicycles were normally used to uh, explain. Because uh, all the other planets were orbiting the Sun, it meant that it did not require epicycles to explain the motion of the planets. However, there was still a great deal of uh, astronomers at that time who weren't really very fond of Tycho Brahe's model because it seemed so arbitrary, such an interesting compromise between different ways of looking at the universe. Question four. Name three important features of Aristotle's model of the universe. Well, uh, we, we know fairly well Aristotle's model of the universe now. It's the geocentric one with all the perfect celestial spheres surrounding it. So let's go through some of its features. It was geocentric, Earth-centered, Earth right in the middle. That's what we've been learning about this whole time. Um, the planets were embedded in a series of concentric crystal spheres around the Earth, and so they were sort of perfect and unchanging and eternal. Uh, the spheres all turned at different rates, which is how uh, Aristotle explained that the planets moved at different rates across the sky. And the stars were all embedded in a single sphere right at the outer edge. And I've actually named four important features, so hopefully it's crossed over with some of the ones that you've named. Question five. Why did the ancient Greeks believe that the universe was geocentric? Well, when we think about it for a bit, it's actually fairly easy to see. The Earth doesn't feel like it's moving. 
This is the sort of big important reason that uh, most of the early models of the universe were geocentric. If we stand on the ground, we don't suddenly get flung off because the Earth is hurtling through space, for example. So the Greeks assumed that the Earth was stationary. Now from the Earth, it looks like the planets and the stars and the sun are all moving around the Earth. Uh, the, re the real reason for this is because it's uh, Earth that's sort of rotating in space and then orbiting around the Sun. Uh, but because they believed that the Earth was stationary, they thought that it was the other celestial bodies that were moving. So the ancient Greeks thought the Earth was stationary, right at the center of the universe, that everything else was revolving around it. Well, that's the end of the questions. So, in this lesson, we've learned about various different geocentric models of the universe, including those of Aristotle, Ptolemy, and Tycho Brahe. Uh, and we've learned a little bit about how they've sort of developed over time. In the next section, we'll be looking a little more at heliocentric models which have the sun at the center of the universe. Mm -hmm.